So good evening um, and welcome uh, one and all to this uh, very special How To Academy event. Um, I'm Matt Dancona, an editor at Tortoise Media and a columnist on the London Evening Standard. And I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome the great Malcolm Gladwell to our gathering tonight. Um, and Malcolm is known for so many books um, that it seems invidious to single one out. Uh, so I'm going to single out his latest, which um, I have here. Uh, I've actually got the paperback and the hardback. Um, but this is uh, Talking to Strangers. And it's one, and I said someone has followed his, his work for uh, many years. It's one I found especially fascinating and thought-provoking and insightful. And um, I think... There are many, many things I want to talk to Malcolm about regarding the book. Um, and I, I, I hope too that you'll, you'll uh, feel the same and, and uh, want to uh, enter your, post your questions for Malcolm in the Q&A box, uh, which, so we can get to as many of them as possible. Um, and I think it's, while it's absolutely true that, that in no way is this a book about what's happened in 2020, or a, a sort of glib attempt to solve the huge kaleidoscope of problems and issues that 2020 is, um, uh, ha has, has put forward. I, I think you'll find, as I did, that it's, it's full of contemporary resonance. So uh, without more ado, um, Malcolm, I, I, I want to begin really at the beginning. Um, with the very moving and intense and painful case study that acts as a kind of bookend to talking to strangers, um, which is um, the case of Sandra Bland and what happened to her in 2015. Can you tell us about that case and how it, it became so important to your uh, your your work on this book. Mm -hmm. Well, there were, <clears throat> you know, prior to George Floyd, there were uh, uh, there was a uh, few years ago, three years ago or so, four years ago now, there were a string of cases involving young African Americans and law enforcement in the United States. That <clears throat> beginning with the Michael Ferguson case, the Michael Brown case in Ferguson, Missouri, which was the first kind of that really set the stage for what we've seen in the last year in America, um, where people were sort of brought attention to um, this this endemic problem between this group and this uh, and and law enforcement, and <clears throat> of that string of cases four years ago, there was one involving a young woman named Sandra Bland who was uh, uh, in a small town in Texas applying for a job. She was from Chicago, and she gets pulled over by a police officer for no particularly good reason. He made up a reason. They get into an argument. The police officer arrests her, pulls her from her car, puts her in jail, and she commits suicide two days later. Um, and <clears throat> I always thought it was one of the most poignant of all of those cases. And it's also a particularly moving and um, enraging case because unlike many of these cases, we have the entire encounter between her and the police officer captured on the police officer's video camera um, and his dash, dash, dash camera of his car. So we know exactly what happened between them. There's no disputing the facts as there normally is in these cases. And that allowed me, I was interested in this general problem of conversations that go awry between strangers. And this was, such a kind of uh, overwhelming example of what I was talking about that I decided to structure my book around the attempt to understand, break down what happened in that interaction. So again, one of the, I think, most striking features of the book, um, uh, and you're, 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 one of the things you do so brilliantly in your writing is combine familiar things with um, nuggets and anecdotes of completely unexpected information and case studies. But there, there are quite a lot of stories in Talking to Strangers which are 
no notionally at least very familiar and worked mm -hmm. through and we know about and you bring a completely new perspective to them and i guess one of the examples of that you know almost at the extreme is one that's sort of etched into history which is a, the, the question that is often answered and never really satisfactorily answered but you often asked and not necessarily satisfactorily answered but i think you you, you, you do um, offer an answer is why did Churchill, who hadn't met Hitler, so better understand Hitler than Neville Chamberlain, who had? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, there are many reasons why Churchill got Hitler right and Chamberlain didn't. I mean, among others, that Churchill was a good deal shrewder as a judge of human nature than than um, Chamberlain was. What I was struck by was the fact that if you look at the world leaders in the late 30s who got Hitler wrong, they were overwhelmingly people who had met him on more than one occasion. And if you look at the group of those who didn't get Hitler wrong, who saw him for who he truly was, they were not entirely, but overwhelmingly people who'd never met him. And to my mind, that raises this question of whether, are we sure if we're trying to get to the bottom of a stranger, a face-to-face -face meeting helps us. Is it possible it might hurt us? So that's, the, that's what I was trying to explore. I don't think, and I think it's fairly plain, that if you read accounts of Chamberlain's meeting with Hitler, it did not improve his understanding of Hitler to beat him. On the contrary, he fell under Hitler's spell. And so, by the way, did William Lyon Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister of Canada, who met Hitler and just came away so blown away and enraptured with him. I mean, there's a list of these leaders who they encounter the man and they just say, you know, he's, it is not by accident that Hitler was, um, rose as far and fast as he did. He was someone possessed of enormous charisma. And, the, you know, being charismatic is not the same thing as being decent or truthful or, and I think as human beings, we have difficulty navigating that distinction that we meet someone and because we warm to them and see evidence of their brilliance or what have you, or um, we, you know, we were inclined to believe them. And I think that's what happens with Chamberlain. And that's what Churchill was prevented against. He was never, never, he never had that confusing moment of being dazzled by, by Hitler's charisma. He was free to make a decision about him on the basis of the facts, right? Whereas Chamberlain, when he comes back from meeting Hitler in Munich, he's talking about how Hitler looked him in the eye and the strength of his handshake and, you know, the 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 tea and bubble handshake and the, yeah, I mean, and and strudel they had. I mean, it was just it, it was just off on some kind of. And I think you know, I don't mean to single out Chamberlain. I think that's a real problem we have with strangers because yeah. we overprivilege the information gathered from a face-to-face -face encounter. Well, that's an interesting thing because, um, you know, contact theory is very, is very prevalent now. The idea that really what, what you need to do in a, in a disaggregated and, and, and polarized society is just bring people together. And people um, often quote, um, you know, the, gold, the, the, the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland and so on as a, and, and the South African experience and so on mm -hmm. as, as, as absolutely the gold standard of this. But one of, the, one of the lessons of your book I took away was um, this really interesting concept of what you call faulty translation. Mm -hmm. can, 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 can you explain what, you know, what, what that is and why it's so important? Yeah, you know, the, we have a baseline assumption. I mean, there's a number of problems in communication that I identify in the book, but I, I, you're referring to this problem with what I call trans, the transparency problem, which is, we have a baseline assumption as human beings that other people's emotions, other people's inner um, emotional states um, can be read by looking at external cues. I can tell whether you're happy by looking at your face and seeing whether you're smiling. I can tell whether you're uh, anxious by looking at your body language. I, you know, I, we, we all have versions of this, there's an endless number of versions of this. We're all we're pretty, players of the tells. Yes, the tells. And we're, as human beings, extraordinarily confident 
into our ability to read these um, signs. And we really do think we know when someone doesn't like us or when someone's lying to us or when someone, and every time psychologists try to verify this intuition and try and figure out, okay, well, do we actually know when we're being lied to? Do you, are you an accurate judge about whether the person you're talking to is happy or sad or anxious or deceitful or what have you? And the answer is that we're not. That, I mean, there's almost nothing that has been studied more in, in, in social psychology than the accuracy of our judgments. And overwhelmingly, the answer is, we're terrible at this. Um, you know, you might as well just guess. Our ability, to, for example, to spot liars is a tiny bit better than chance. And that's only because there's a very small subsection of people who are such extravagantly terrible liars that you, you know, it's impossible to get them wrong. If you take yeah. those people out, it's basically a coin flip. So you know, if, you, one, if, you, if you control for the sort of crazy pathological liar, actually it's, it makes no difference. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, confronting how bad we are at this, to my mind, is a very, very important task um, for those who want to make strength, sense of, of strangers. Now, if I might go back to something you said, you were, I wouldn't lump, Chamberlain's visit with Hitler, which was two relatively brief visits with something like Good Friday. Because remember the Good Friday Accord is deep, intense conversation, you know, is, is, is um, prefaced by extraordinary numbers of deep, complicated, long, um, intense meetings between all of the relevant parties. I really do feel like if you're going to spend six months with someone trapped in a conference yeah, room, yeah. You, you can get to know them. Uh, had Chamberlain committed 1938 to learning about Hitler and fl flew there every week to spend Friday with him, we might have had a different story, right? <laughs> um, you know, you could be charmed by Donald Trump if you have a cup of coffee with him. It's doubtful you will be as charmed by him if you're trapped in a six prison cell with him. Yeah, no, yeah actually, six exactly. months. Yeah. So, so um, into this uh, uh, arena, the psychological arena, walk a number of figures in your book, and one of them is Bernie Madoff. And of course, um, the people perhaps start from the wrong end of this, which is how did he get away with it? Um, what I think your account explains is that not that it was easy, but that. Um, Things were stacked in Madoff's favor in a number of ways in terms of human psychology. Now, can you, can, you, can you talk about Madoff? Because he's such an intriguing character. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think you kind of nailed him in this. It's, 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 a, it's a really good part of the book. Yeah. Well, so Bernie Madoff is, of course, the most egregious, the most successful Ponzi schemer in history. The American financier who bilks uh, builds a fund of, of, I think, 50 odd billion dollars, and all of it is lies. He, he doesn't own a single stock. It's all made up. And he gets away with this for uh, 20 years and is never actually caught. He turns himself in um, because I think he thought he was going to get bumped off by some of his, by <laughs> some of his, uh, of his uh, clients. Um, so it's an extraordinary story. You build a 55 billion dollar Ponzi scheme built on sand and no one ever catches you. Um, there is one person, however, who sus strongly suspected that Madoff was uh, not what he said he was, that was a Ponzi schemer. And that guy, whose name is Harry Markopoulos, could not convince anyone in the American regulatory apparatus um, that uh, his analysis of Madoff was correct. He tried repeatedly and no one would listen to him. So what do we make of this? Well, there's a theory I spend a lot of time on in the book, which is this notion called default to truth, which says that as human beings, we are hardwired to believe, instinctively believe what we're told. And we only reach for the conclusion that someone might be lying to us if the evidence gets absolutely overwhelming. Um, and that idea is a very, very, very simple, but an extraordinarily powerful idea. It explains so much of human psychology. And the reason we do this, that we default to truth, which is this wonderful term by uh, a guy named Levine, whose, whose work I've relied on um, 
uh, uh, for my book. Um, Levine argues that um, because from an evolutionary standpoint, it's much more advantageous to trust everyone than it is to suspect everyone. That if you implicitly trust others, you can build um, society, you can build organizations, you can, you can collaborate with people, you can, I mean, there's, an, there's no end, your, your communication is efficient. If I spent, you, you have simply declared yourself to be Matthew, haven't you? I don't know that you're Matthew. Yeah. I have no independent cooperation you are, who you say you are. If I had decided before I had this conversation with you to verify that you were Matthew, journalist, Englishman, I could, we wouldn't have had the conversation. So right? We would have been identification and papers. I mean, I could have, you know, calling or your, you would have given me sources that I would have had to check, you know, I, it could have gone on for weeks. So yeah. there's no point. Since most people are honest, Levine argues, there's no point in us being, in, there's no point in being instinctively skeptical. So what Madoff does is he simply, and what all uh, um, uh, con men do, is they take advantage of this. So long as they can present a reasonably plausible case, they can get away with it. Um, and they can get away with it for, uh, you know, for extended periods of time. And that's the, that's the story of, law, of spies. It's the story of, I mean, that's what got me writing this book in the first place was I couldn't figure out why every single spy story I read, in every single spy story I read, the spy quite happily spy without getting caught for 10 years. How is it so easy to spy, right? It didn't make any sense to me. Well, you know, um, and this is the explanation that even spy agencies are inclined to believe at first blush until evidence becomes overwhelming. So actually a, um, a measure of credulity or gullibility or whatever you want to call it is, is the price that we, is an absolute precondition of, of, of social organization. Of civil society. Oh yeah. 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 To be gullible. We need to stop this notion that gullibility is somehow a sign of naivete and of weakness. Nonsense. Gullibility is what makes the world go round, right? You said you were Matthew. I believed you. Yeah. As a result, we are having this conversation. Having conversation. If either of us was, were not gullible, this would not have happened, right? Now, right. multiply that times you know, a trillion and you have why human society <laughs> works. <laughs> Now, another, another um, uh, really uh, important um, idea in the book, which um, you, you, you explore particularly vividly through the cases of Amanda Knox and Sylvia Plath, is um, the idea of coupling. Mm -hmm. I think a very subtle uh, and very ingenious and fascinating idea. C could you, um, uh, perhaps with a, an allusion to those two cases, Explain a bit more about that. Yeah, coupling <clears throat> is just this idea that one of the things that's confusing about making sense of strangers' behavior um, is that very often behavior is tightly coupled to a context or a particular environment or a particular moment. Um, and unless you understand the context, you can't decode the behavior. So I spend a lot of time in the book talking about suicide, which is a really good example of this, that we have a notion, an intuitive notion of suicide, that it is decoupled. That is to say that someone who intends to take their own life will take their own life by whatever means is available, because what matters is their intention, right? Once you've decided you want to give it up, you'll just, just you know, you'll seize whatever means there are to do that and end your own life. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is not how society, how suicide works at all. In fact, people who are suicidal are tightly coupled to a means of committing suicide. There are people who intend to commit suicide by shooting themselves with a gun. And if you take away the gun, they don't commit suicide. They don't just switch to jumping off a bridge. It's not fungible, this desire. It's, it's coupled. Um, and that is a really, you know, it took a generation for people to, more than that, many generations for people to understand that it made sense to put up suicide uh, railings on bridges that were being used by people to commit suicide. Because the response would always be, 
well, why would I put a big expensive fence up on that bridge if people will just walk to another bridge or a tall building and jump off? It's no point. Like there's a limit, there's a limitless number of places you can commit suicide. That turns out to be wrong. That you can absolutely lower the level of suicides by putting up railings on a particular bridge that is favored by people who want to commit suicide because suicide is coupled to that bridge. There's some connection we don't entirely understand between the act and the context. And that, once you start to play with that notion, and I, I also talk about that notion in the context of drinking and sexual assault in, in this book, that one of the, reason, one of the reasons, one, that has, one of the things that has frustrated our attempt to deal with the epidemic of sexual assault, particularly on college campuses, university campuses, is we failed to understand that it is a behavior coupled to a thing, alcohol. Um, and you need to decouple those two things if you would, can deal if you are to deal successfully with the with the problematic behavior and we're we we kind of approach this problem without understanding the all of the behaviors and contexts into which it is rooted and that it's to me is a really really powerful and, and sort of overlooked notion when it comes to dealing with strangers so um in in, in the case of amanda knox the coupling seemed to me to to have a yet, yet another application which was that the problem was that there she was, um, Bridger, um, her friend had been brutally murdered. Um, and she, she was one of those people who doesn't necessarily behave in a way that, you know, is, is conformist or predictable. Or, and, and of course, that normally doesn't matter at all. But she had the, literally the eyes of the world upon her. Mm -hmm. And this you know, to a grotesque extent led to a presumption of guilt. So, so coupling, I, I take it Malcolm has, has a kind of um, a relevance both, both to, to what you were describing there, but also to um, people's actions and the context in which they immediately find themselves. Yeah, I, I think of her as really a better example of the first thing I was talking about, which is this problem of transparency that <clears throat> She's a, she behaves in a slightly odd manner and people interpreted the oddness of her manner as evidence of guilt, um, when in fact it wasn't. She's just a little bit weird. Um, that to me is the most parsimonious way of, um, you know, the British tabloid media had a, and the, and the Italian uh, prosecution had a stereotypical notion of what a young woman ought to look like and behave like if her roommate's been murdered. And Amanda Knox did not fit that preconception. And as a result, people thought she was guilty. That, as weird as it sounds, that sentence I have just given you is the, is 100% the explanation of what happened to Amanda Knox. Yeah. Because there was never any evidence. Yeah. Right? It was all based on these inferences from the fact that she's just a little, she behaves a little bit oddly in those yeah. kinds of situations. And she was, by the way, a kid. She's a the time was a teenager. I mean, anyone who knows anything about teenagers knows they, they do not behave in ways that are necessarily predictable. So um, obviously, one of the questions that rises from your book is, you know, we, 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 are, we, we are at least told that we, we are living in an age of, you know, dramatic tribalism, social cantonization, and polarization and, and and almost we've reached the point where um, we define ourselves by those we treat as strangers and that this has been this uh, has been dramatically weaponized by the rise of social media so does your does your book have lessons for I mean first of all do you agree with that the, the mm -hmm. kind of we, we live in a tribalized world and, and, and if you do, 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 do you think your book has, has lessons for that pathologized mm. world? Well, we certainly live in a world where the challenge of dealing with strangers is um, much more relevant than it was in the past. I mean, if you compare my life to my grandfather's life, I have, you know, my grandfather was a, a proper middle-class Englishman with a dog who lived in Seven Oaks. He took the same train every morning into the city to work at a, in a mid-level job at an insurance company. 
came home, walked the dog, walked in the garden, went to the same church every Sunday. I mean, how many strangers did my grandfather meet in the course of a given week? I don't, very few. I mean, did he, tra- I, don't, I don't think he traveled much beyond Kent. I mean, now compare that to my life. I probably have met, you know, many, many orders of magnitude more strangers than, uh, than he has, than he did. Um, so this issue, it, you know, if he was bad at decoding strangers, it wouldn't have mattered that much because he had so few encounters with people he didn't know. It really does matter for someone like who's living in, who's an adult in 2021 or 2020. Um, so that's sort of, yeah, I do think that is why this issue is of, um, or, you know, to go back to the Sandra Bland case, um, the, fundamentally that was a case about a, a police officer is dealing with someone who he, he does not know, has no context for understanding her behavior. Um, when I was a kid, I grew up in a small town the police officer was the father of someone I went to both school and church with and whose wife was best friends with my mom. It, I got stopped by him once and there was no chance that police stop could go awry because it was John Campbell. I knew John Campbell. He knew who I was. And you know what he said to me? The first thing he said to me was, do I need to tell your parents about how fast you were driving? <laughs> right? Now, so do you say that once the communication is on that plane, you've limited the possibility of, I'm not going to pull a gun on John Campbell, am I? And John Campbell is not going to rough me up and put me in a chokehold, is he? He's met me before, right? So, it, you know, in, a, in kind of um, small town life, these issues don't arise. They do arise in a global world where um, our encounters are much more likely to be with with people who we don't know. I'm, I'm curious about how in, in, in your kind of uh, in your assessment of all this, our relationship with celebrities um, fits in, because mm-hmm. it seems to me there that the, you know, the, 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 the human need for credulity um, is often most pronounced. I mean, you saw that in the, the, the and you see it still with the very, very strong defense of Michael Jackson by his fans and, and R. Kelly and people like that. And mm-hmm. um, without necessarily going into individual cases, that, that there, 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 is a, there is a desire some, somewhere in all this to, um, to kind of put our de- default truth on a planetary basis. And yeah. I'm, fa- I'm really fascinated in what your thoughts might be on, 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 on the celebrity side of it. Well, you know, the celebrity is really another form of kind of, um, of exploitation of this human desire, this human cre- credulity. Um, because if I am a celebrity and I have, and I'm reasonably savvy, and I have such access to forms of media and meeting my, and, and encountering my, my I can create an illusion of intimacy with my fans. Um, you know, you, I'm always, I'm always astonished by how often people refer to actors or sports stars by their first names as if they know them. And it's because we do really do feel we know them, right? Even though, of course, we don't even remotely know them. We see only the slight edited, um, uh, 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 kind of feed about them. But there is that, you know, the human desire wants to, the human mind wants to, at heart wants to take that little sliver of information and kind of magnify it into intimacy. And that, you're absolutely right. I think that makes our willingness to kind of um, side with, uh, with celebrities and believe them and follow them down all, many, all, all manner of dark roads. Um, all, all the more likely. And it also struck me reading the book that, uh, that part of a sort of, you might have actually, um, in addition to everything else, helped to explain um, the proliferation of, or partly explain the proliferation of fake news and conspiracy theories and post-truth, because actually what they all have in common is a desire to believe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 as it were, the, the, the perfect evolutionary infrastructure 
in the default truth has been provided, hasn't it, for people who are uh, selling misinformation? Yeah. Well, yeah, I would, yes, I think you're right. I would flip it and say, it makes you realize that the only way to be properly skeptical in the world um, is to be trained to be, popular, to be properly skeptical. So there's a reason why scientists um, call themselves scientists and spend as much time as they do becoming scientists, because what they are learning is to try and overturn, in some sense, overturn this fundamental human desire to, to instinctively believe, to be credulous, um, you know, to let our heart get in the way of our head. You know, uh, science is all about the trying to disable that fundamental human impulse, right? I know this looks promising, let's wait. Um, I, know, I know you think you have an explanation for what's happening, but let me run three more tests just to be sure. That's really hard, right? Um, but that's what their training gives them. So exactly in that spirit, I suppose, um, you advise us to proceed, and I'm quoting, with caution and humility. Mm -hmm. um, now it's interesting because we, we, we're living in a time where um, how we deal with difference is a massive of intense debate. You know, it's uh, uh, the horrors of Charlottesville still very vivid. Um, mm -hmm. The aftermath of George Floyd's murder, what what happened in Kenosha, and and so on and so on, and, and these the, the the othering of of of, of groups of people by populist politicians is now, you know, a very significant part of um, political discourse. I sense in the book that you're saying, partly you're issuing a warning that there is no, no glib answer to this. That there, that, you know, there, there is, there was a wonderful surge in the summer of, of, of protest and solidarity and so forth. Rereading the book, I felt, the, 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 you know, it's not a pessimistic book by any means, mm -hmm. but it does have a straight, a strong strain of realism on, on this matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I think we sort of, for example, on this question of default to truth, we instinctively believe what others tell us, and that is a foundational. Um, uh, that's a cornerstone of civil society. So what do we do about the fact that this means we'll be occasionally deceived? What I would say is nothing. I, I think we just have to accept that. I, this is an unpopular notion, but I don't even think that Bernie Madoff, the experience of Bernie Madoff should have caused us to re-examine our laws, you know, our, regula our regulatory procedures in the United States. I would just shrug and say, you know, every, now, every generation you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to deal with the fact that someone's gonna exploit our, our credulity do you really want to turn everyone in who works in finance into a potential bad guy by thinking the worst of everyone? No, I think the dangers that are that come from thinking the worst of everyone are far greater than the dangers that come from occasional deception. What I would just say to someone is, probably shouldn't put all your money in one place, <laughs> particularly with a guy who can't tell you what he's doing with your money, right? Yeah. There are plenty of safe places to put your money. Yeah. Put them there. That's what I. That's how I would resolve. Yeah, you, that. you have to price a little gullibility into your portfolio. Yeah, very, very yeah, cool. yeah. Now, well, I, you know, I, a, a good example. Another good example of this. You know, people forget there was a there was a um, it was a period like I think I think I'd be right about fifty years ago, when there was a rash of accusations against dentists for allegedly sexually assaulting yeah. their patients when they were under anesthesia. There's a long, I, it's a, there's a long, complicated explanation for what was going on, but um, we had two options. We could have uh, suspected every dentist might be a potential sexual assaulter, or we can do what the profession did, which was they just made sure that when you're under anesthesia, there's always two people in the room. Yeah. It's why there's always a, there's always a dentist plus somebody, right? Uh, and that's, you know, there's many reasons for that. That's one of the reasons, is it just put someone else there. So yeah. in Job the done. one out of a million cases where the dentist is a bad guy, he can't do anything, yeah. right? Yeah. That, I love that, the simplicity and the elegance 
So we're not turning each other into uh, the world into this big paranoid suspicious place. We're just doing a simple safeguard and now we can stop worrying about it. Now there's some fantastic questions coming in from uh, people uh, who have uh, posted them. Um, uh, uh, one uh, asked by, I, I hope I get the pronunciation right, Peggy, from Peggy Susak uh, Dannenbaum, uh, which is, how does this reconcile with your theories in Blink, Malcolm? Uh, oh, I mean, do, you, uh, do you see a conflict? Oh yes, I do see a conflict. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, uh, well, so, Blink is, I think of my books as, um, in some sense, answers. So Tipping Point, in one of the chapters of my first book, Tipping Point, I advanced a theory of law enforcement that I now regard as dangerously misleading and naive. And I corrected it in subsequent books. Blink advanced an argument, which in the main I still agree with, but I feel like I was too should as a chapter in that book where I do endorse the idea that we can learn to be pretty good at reading other people's emotions. I now no longer believe that. So this book is a kind of advances the argument, if you will, that was, that was, uh, that was first um, put forth in Blink. But I think that that's what, if you are someone who writes for a living and writes for over a long period of time, I think you are obliged to do that to be constantly updating your ideas in the light of your own maturity and in the light of new evidence. So I would, I would say, yeah, it's, uh, this is a way of, this looks back at a specific part of the Blink argument and, um, and adjusts it um, quite substantially in the light of what I, what I feel I better understand now. Leander Winden asks, uh, what's the most distinctive memory you have of misinterpreting a stranger's behavior? That's a good question. Of, of misinterpreting strangers. Yes. Oh, I mean, here's a good question. Um, well, you know, so if I make a list of all of the people who are my friends, and then I ask myself, when I first met them, did I anticipate that I would become good friends with them? And I see, I feel like my success rate in correctly spotting a potential friend upon first meeting is about 50%. So about half the time I'm fundamentally wrong about <laughs> someone based on a person, you know, so I mean, that, no, actually there you go. Quite a decent rate to me, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, probably high. <laughs> uh, Cindy Bamba asks an interesting question about um, default truth. Um, do you think that, that when we exercise the default truth, that it varies um, depending on who, who we're dealing with, for instance, if a, if a white police officer is dealing with a black man, for example, is, is there a, are, are there variances in this? I think they would have to be. Um, but I think the fundamentally, I guess I would turn that, let me, let me, let me I would turn that question around and say, we are equipped by evolution with a powerful desire to believe and simply believe what others tell us. But there are specific times and places when our own procedures, experiences, or biases may temporarily disable that um, fundamental belief. So a police officer who is deeply racist may be inclined to depart from his normal pattern of default to truth when he is dealing with a young black man. That would be an example. Now, Mind you, he doesn't depart 100%. He still proceeds on the basis that much of what he's being told is true. He's just filtering it through his own kind of um, uh, discriminatory and biased uh, framework. But you can't, you couldn't, ha he couldn't, you can't be a police officer and not on some level believe what people are telling you, right? Except that some, there's some truth buried in there. I mean, there, you, you can't be a human being and abandon this impulse. Yeah. It's because it, the, without that impulse, you cannot communicate with anyone. So uh, an another very interesting question from Tam McDonald says, tolerating bad apples like Matt Madoff in the context of finance makes sense as you explain it, Malcolm. How does, but how does this, 
toleration, if that's the word, uh, carry into politics when the cynicism of people like Dominic Cummings here in the UK and Steve Bannon makes clear that bad faith is systemic. Uh, mm -hmm. Tolerating that can lead to disaster. Do you have any thoughts on, as it were, again, are there, are there contexts where one simply can't afford to, 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 to be, so to speak, credulous? Well, we have a mechanism in politics for dealing with that, which is an election, which says at regular intervals, we have a chance to review the wisdom of our decisions. And um, I feel like that mechanism is about as good um, uh, a way of dealing with our mistakes as you can have. Um, you know, very few institutions in contemporary Western society have a review mechanism as rigorous as politics. You don't get to review your judgments about your teacher at midterm, right? You don't get to say, I chose you as my professor of mathematics in September. It is now January. I would respectfully request another professor of mathematics, right? <laughs> you can't do that. I got you wrong in, in September. It's now January. I want a new, you know, you're stuck, right? Uh, you don't get to review the, your boss at regular intervals like that. You can't say, well, I thought you were a decent chap. You're not. No, but in politics, actually, we do get that chance. So um, I... The mechanism. Yeah, so I would agree politics, unfortunately, and particularly now, seems to be a, a, a kind of beacon for every, um, every grifter under the sun. <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't always thus. And every now and again, uh, you get a real prize. Um, I mean, I always think about this because I've been writing so much about, in my podcast about World War II, uh, the extraordinary good fortune that both uh, the United States and England in the period from 1939 to 1945 were blessed with once in a lifetime quality leadership. I mean, it happens. What are the chances? What, you know, it, two, two of the major combatants on the right side of that conflict got one in a million lucky with who their leader was. So that just makes me think the system this, 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 this system of regular review can turn up some real prizes from time to time. So saying this, let's ask a really good question, which is um, on your podcast, Revisionist History, which I'm a big fan, you talk about how you picked your assistants, which uh, is totally in conflict with what you talk about in talking to strangers. What would you do differently this time when recruiting an assistant? Um, yeah, I was, uh, well, is it in conflict with talking to strangers? I'm not sure. So talking to strangers says it's very difficult to read a stranger. And so when, I, when you're hiring an assistant, you're hiring a stranger. And that episode of my podcast was all about how when I went back over the reasons, I realized I had hired every, every hiring decision I had made in the course of my writing career had been frivolous. That is to say, the furthest thing from rigorous. I basically just randomly hire the first person who walks in the door um, on the grounds that if it is so difficult to read a stranger, why bother? <laughs> just why, why try, why go through all the rigmarole if you're likely to be wrong? Um, <laughs> why not just say, all right, why don't you try, you know? And I think that's actually consistent with talking to strangers and I would encourage others to follow suit. And I believe, I actually believe there should be far more random assignment of people in society. Um, in almost all areas. I think we need to give up on this foolish notion that we can thoughtfully and intelligently make sense of others in short periods of time. We just can't. So, uh, Meg Crow asks, um, why do you think some people so strongly reject accepted truth, such as the earth is round, and then bind so closely to a much less substantiated position like flat earth? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it's a great question, and I guess I would say because their standard for what accepted truth is is different than yours. So a scientist would say accepted truth is something that is in accordance with known physical laws and, in, and has the agreement of the majority of people who are expert in that particular field, right? That's their definition of what truth is. But if you're somebody who's terribly interested in the question of whether the shape of the earth is still an unknown, <laughs> um, 
then I don't think that's your standard of truth. I think your standard of truth may be something that it, your small circle of friends believes or something that confirms some pre-existing bias you have about the world. You know, so if you think that all people who have uh, PhDs are uh, pretentious, um, dangerously uh, elitist um, liars who are pulling a fast one over the rest of us, then an idea that has their support is suspect, right? So there's a case where your bias has the effect of changing your definition of what real is. I think a lot of people who believe these crazy theories are people who just have adopted a different set of criteria for establishing veracity. So uh, just, just Quinton um, sort of turns the thing on his head, uh, on his head rather, and, and says, given the potential for human conflict in the typical interactions of everyday life with family, friends, and colleagues, how is it that there is an even more large scale conflict between larger groups and nations? I mean, I suppose that's your book, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we end up, we, it turns out we can muddle through. Yeah. Um, and muddling through, you know, I, I get even in the midst of all of the insanity going on right now in the United States um, and England, but not, I would trade your problems for ours in a heartbeat. Um, you know, I have faith that the system's pretty resilient and will survive this particular um, uh, abomination. Um, and I think people, are fundamentally decent and want things to work and will work together when they have to. I don't, you know, I'm not a, I don't mean in any way in this book to say that human beings are, there's something malignant about human nature. On the contrary, I think there's something beautiful about it. And we should stop trying to kind of, just stop trying to overreach and do things we, we're not equipped to do. Um, namely, make sense of others in a kind of, um, successful way. I mean, is it really, here's the thing, we get into so much trouble when we insist on knowing the answer to a question prematurely. Why do I need to decide whether you are a good person, Matthew, within one minute of talking to you? Why can't I wait? Why can't I just table the issue? Yeah. And, you know, and it's our inability just to say, well, let's just wait. Um, let me get to know you before I decide whether you should work at this you know, establishment or whether I should marry you or whether I should do anything, a number of things with you. It, it's, I mean, I think, I think part of that is that um, friendship has, uh, and, and, um, and even intimacy have been, com have been commodified and, and that they, they, they've, they've been something that, that it, you know, you involve instant gratification. You know, if you, if you, if you don't, take to someone or you don't want to be with them immediately that that's wrong and actually mm. the, the 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 older habits of of as you say getting to know someone are, are perhaps not as um prevalent as they used to be anyway yeah yeah my brother who's a a uh, a principal of an elementary school talks about this a lot with um hiring teachers that you know, you, you always think as a principal, you can tell who's going to be a good teacher. And he says, actually, he's been doing it for hiring teachers for 30 years. He says, I, he, I, he says, I have no idea. You just have to wait and see whether they can teach. I mean, you could play all these fancy games and test them a million ways. But fundamentally, you hire them or you put them on, you hire them provisionally. You go and you sit in the back of their classroom and you see whether they can do the job. <laughs> now, why that seems like a revelation. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, so why don't just build a system where we do that? And if you turn out not to be a good teacher, where no one considers it to be a failure of the system. We just consider it to be, oh, that's fine. This particular job you're not good at. You're not good at why, yeah. don't, why don't you try something else? Like, I just wish there was so much more of a spirit of experimentation built into our, the way we make sense of each other. And then we wouldn't get into these situations where we're, or like with Bernie Madoff, what I said earlier, just don't give all your money to him. You know, just accept the fact, oh, there's a chance I'm wrong about him, so I'll give him 10% of my money. Well, part okay, of it like, is, 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 is that we've, we've come to con confuse data with knowledge. 
So you, 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 people, you, you can test for anything. But yeah. That doesn't mean you can. That doesn't mean you're going to be a good teacher or a wise. You know. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, 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 there's a interesting question here from Heather Anson. Uh, speaking of tests, um, you discuss implicit bias and the Harvard test in your book. Um, Heather says there's a misconception that this bias equals racist. How would you explain this to someone to avoid the general knee-jerk reaction that implicit bias means a person is racist? Um, lots there. Yeah. Well. So there's a distinction between implicit bias is simply measures what are your instinctive responses in a situation. And those instinctive responses are a function of your um, life experience. So, you know, I grew up with a black mother. Uh, black, the black women I was exposed to as a kid were my mom, my aunt, my grandmother, various cousins. I had, if you'd done any kind of implicit bias testing on me at the age of 10, my implicit responses to black women would have been overwhelmingly positive. Does that mean I'm not a racist? No, it means that I just, my experience with black women has been, you know, the black women in my life were warm, loving, hilarious, you know, great people. That's how I, so, well, that's one. So your implicit bias is simply the sum total of your experience. Racism is the decision that you make, the conscious decisions you make in society about how you treat people. And you can make conscious decisions that are in conflict with your implicit biases. In fact, that's what we want people to do, right? You know, there are lots of, of situations where my implicit feeling might be, ooh, or I don't, I don't feel comfortable here, or if, you know, if I'm a doctor treating the sick, I may have a implicit emotional reaction that someone looks awful, but I overcome that and I give them the benefit of my knowledge and care. Why? Because that's what it means to be a good doctor. Well, also what it means to be a good person is to overcome those, set those implicit feelings aside and act as a moral person. And being acting as a moral person means be governed by your deliberate, conscious, ethical impulses. Um, so they, these are, these two things are fundamental. It is, it is, in other words, just as possible for someone who grew up in the most lily white of environments to be, um, to be racially um, uh, uh, non-discriminatory and open and progressive as it is someone who grew up in the most progressive environments, right? Because it's not about, it's about overcoming your impulses, not about being a slave to your impulses. Jeremy Coleman asks, um, I'm interested in Malcolm's thoughts and a deeper explanation about the views around so-called cancel culture and the situ around, situation around the letter, which I take to mean the, the, the Harper's Magazine letter. Oh yeah. Um, which we all remember. Um, Caused a great deal of, yes. Uh, yes. yes, there's a fair amount of, <laughs> fair amount yeah. of heat around that. Um, <laughs> It, it is an intriguing question, isn't it? I mean, you know, the arguments are, in some respects have all been aired, but 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 I, I, I am interested in what you what mm -hmm. you think about the, the whole idea of cancel culture and whether it exists. Yeah. Well, you know, there are heightened sensitivity around certain issues today. Although I would point out, there's always been heightened sensitivity about certain issues. If you were a teacher on a college campus in, in the United States in 1954, and you said that you loved the Soviet Union and were a dedicated Marxist-Leninist, you would have gotten canceled. Yeah. Right? If you had stood up in that same college campus and said that you were, uh, you were gay and you were openly living with your gay lover and that you intended to tell the students in your class uh, to abandon their uh, their their uh, prejudices against gay people, you would have gotten canceled, right? You'd be out of a job in five minutes. So it's not new. Each each era has its own set of things that it gets all riled up about. Um, ours happened to be for someone of and it, you know old fogies like me look at the kinds of things that people get riled up today who are younger than me, and I think why are they getting riled up about that? But of course. 
I also got rattled about my own particular set of things when I was 25 years old. So, um, you, didn't have you know, this is all, it's always with us. And you I think have, you didn't have Twitter, did you? I mean, that, 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 that's the difference is that yeah, it, kind of, well, yeah, but I mean, I don't, I think the difference is that what I would, my 25 year old self needed to be told to cool it. And similarly, the 25 year old people today need to be told to cool it. And the 25 year olds in 1954 should have been told to cool it. That we should be fighting in any era, the impulse to get terribly worked up over something that is at the end of the day, not that serious, right? Does it matter if your economics professor in 1955 is a Marxist? Actually, no, it does, it's probably a good thing, right? Does it matter if today a college professor says something that's not politically correct, you know, no, learn from it, deal with it, argue with the professor. You don't have to chase the person out of town. So I, 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 I resist the impulse that this is something specific to our, to this particular moment. Yeah, yeah, sure, I think it's sure, always sure. been with us and we should always be on guard against it. Fast reaching the end of the hour, Malcolm, um, but there is a question that's appeared in various forms and I hope People attending will forgive me if I if I just um, uh, compress it into one, which is essentially what what makes you optimistic. What it, it, what if anything makes you optimistic about as you look look to the future as a writer, as a thinker, as a you know someone who's hugely influential. What what what, what makes you look with hope? Uh, well, you know, uh, I'm not. This is not dodging the question. I, my, my, my parents, my father is now uh, no longer with us, but he was very optimistic. And my mother who is with us is profoundly optimistic. And she sends me, even in the darkest moments, she will send me, you know, little notes, which encourage me to look on the bright side. And um, there's something incredibly uh, persuasive and infectious about my mother's optimism that has just spilled over into me. Um, as a child, I was always drawn to my mother's ability to see the silver lining. Um, a lot of what she did, she did just by lowering expectations. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if she if she had one little bite of something delicious, she would consider the day a, a, a roaring success. No, that was a good day. <laughs> yes. So I, I I stay optimistic by doing as my mother told me by lowering my expectations and by looking for something positive wherever I can find it. I, 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 sh I should add, um, and I'm not going to spoil it for those that haven't yet read the book, there is an absolutely joyous anecdote about Malcolm's father at a hotel lobby. At, oh yes, that's right. Which, yeah. which, which will, will, it is impossible not to feel <laughs> a little happier about the world when you've read yes. that anecdote. Um, yeah. Malcolm, thank you so much for your thoughts and wisdom. Yeah. Uh, this is the book, Talking to Strangers, classic Gladwell, uh, read and enjoy. And uh, thank you all for attending. And thank you especially to the brilliant, magnificent Malcolm Gladwell for sparing us this time. Uh, good. Have a good evening. Bye for thank now. Thank you, Matthew. Bye-bye.